You may be seated, church. Well, good morning, church. It looks like you survived daylight savings time. One fellow said, the abomination of desolation. Well, it's not quite that bad if that extra hour of daylight just doesn't kill all the flowers. That's kind of what you are concerned about. So we're going to hang in there. You look good. You look good. I'd like to encourage you to come on Wednesday nights. It's my privilege to lead a very brief Bible study time and then have a wonderful prayer time. They have an excellent meal, starts at 5, and then we start at 6 o'clock with Bible study. Right now we're studying how to pray for lost people. How do you pray for people who do not know Jesus? So you come and join us this coming Wednesday evening. This morning we're going to look at Luke chapter 19. I'm going to read verses 1 through 10. Very familiar passage of Scripture. I still remember as a little person in Sunday school singing that song about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. But I tell you what, he was a little man that stood tall when he met the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Amen. Do you ever feel alone? There are eight billion people in our world. You're one of that amount. Does it make you feel insignificant? Or if you just want to come down to the United States of America, there are about uh, 332 million people in the United States. Makes you kind of feel like a little grain of sand up on a seashore. One person among 332 million. Or if you want to bring it down a little bit more in New Mexico, Population is about 2,100,000. 2 million 2 is still a pretty big number. And that can really make you feel isolated and all alone. Well, even here in Albuquerque, we've got about 562,600 people, half a million people. And every day we bump elbows and we see people. We drive down the street with people. But sometimes you feel like you're just the Lone Ranger and Tonto is completely nowhere to be found. You ever feel just all alone? All alone. Zacchaeus felt that way for several reasons. I'm sure that um, maybe he didn't feel quite, quite a man because of his shortness of statue. Maybe that made him feel alone. But also, his, his profession definitely made him feel alone. The Scripture says that he was a chief tax collector. That means that he had made a bid with the Roman government to collect taxes among the Jewish people. And he had to have a certain amount to flow back to Rome. But whatever he could get above that, he got to pocket it. He got to keep it. 
And when it says he was a chief tax collector, it makes you think maybe he even had people that worked under him, that he was kind of the big boss and he had other folks out there collecting taxes. And it would kind of be like uh, Putin sending someone from Russia over here to collect taxes from Americans for Russia. That was what his profession really was, and that really could cut him off. In fact, no one ever invited him to a wedding or to a birthday party. If people saw him coming, they probably crossed the street not to meet him because he was one of the most despised professionals among all the Jewish society. He heard Jesus was coming. I'm sure he had heard something about Jesus, his healing ministry, maybe the feeding of the hungry. He wanted to see him, so he climbed up into a sycamore fig tree. Jesus was going to come by that way, and he wanted to get the best look he was, that was possible. And sure enough, Jesus was coming up the street, and he got right to the tree, and he looked up, and he said, uh, Zacchaeus, Come down, for today I want, to, I want to come to your house. One of those rare occasions where Jesus ever invited himself to somebody's house. People wanted to invite him, especially with his healing ministry and his teaching abilities. But this time he said, uh, I need to go home with you. I'm sure that Zacchaeus literally burned the bark off of that tree getting to the ground. And when he sat down with Jesus in his house, they began to talk. Now you have a pretty good idea what they talked about. Jesus wanted him to experience the forgiveness of his sins and to become a born-again child of God. Jesus talked about how he could have a personal relationship with the eternal God of the ages through Christ, who is the only begotten Son of God, and the Savior of the world. And praise the Lord, the Scripture tells us that Zacchaeus did experience Jesus. He gave a testimony about any time that a person's pocketbook ever gets saved, you're pretty sure their heart's been saved. And he says, now, I'm going to give back to the poor. I'm going to give to people that I have uh, literally robbed from them. I'm going to restore all of that. This morning I want us to look at eight things about Jesus and me. You say, preacher, we'd like to be out of here before two o'clock. Well, you hang, you fasten your uh, pew belt and hang on because we're going to move. But I want you to get the message about Jesus and me because it is so important. First of all, Jesus knows my name. Jesus knows my name. There may be eight billion people in this world, but He knows the name of Claude Cohn, and He knows your name. He knows everything about your name. Why parents gave you that name. If you got married, what your maiden name was, and now what your married name is. He literally knows our name. He is that personal. He's that individual to know our name. I think all of us likes to hear our name. And just, just imagine for a moment when Jesus looked up and said, Zacchaeus. He didn't say, hey, you up in the tree. He said, Zacchaeus, I want you to come down. Jesus desires our name to be in a book of eternal life. The Scripture says this, Another book was opened, which is the book of life. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Jesus wants your name in the book of eternal life. Praise the Lord, not our social security number, our zip code. He wants our name in a book of eternal life. And when it's there, and we, by the way, you get it put there by taking Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I can just see the angel as he tiptoes over to that book of life and with a little dip of fresh ink, and he puts your name right in there. When you trust Jesus 
personally. And if your name is not there, the Scripture says those whose name is not there, they're going to be cast into a lake of fire. You don't want that to happen. You want your name in the book. And so does Jesus. And Jesus knows your name. Second of all, I want you to notice this. Jesus knows who I am. He doesn't just know a name, but He knows who I am. He knows that I'm, a, I'm of the male gender. He knows that. The hairs of my head are numbered. He knows that. They're getting easier to number as the years go by. But still, He is that individual and personal. He knows exactly how many, how many hairs are in our head. He knows the moment that we were conceived in our mother's womb. He knows the moment and the place where we were born. He knows exactly the moment, the place, and exactly how it's going to happen when we die. He knows all of that. He knows everything about us. When Jesus was choosing the twelve disciples, it tells us in John chapter 1, verses 47 and 49, that one of these disciples was a man by the name of Nathaniel. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said to him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. You remember what Jesus said about him now. Here is an Israelite in whom there is nothing false. Jesus knew his heart. He knew what he was on the inside. And then Nathanael said this. He said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. You know, a lot of people, they want to stay away from Bible things, Jesus things, because of things in their past. And they just don't want to be confronted with those things. Let me set your heart at ease. Jesus knows every sin we've ever committed. And He wants to forgive them. He knows every thought we've ever thought. In fact, the Scripture says God knows our thoughts before we think them. He knows our words before we speak them. He knows everything about us. But God loves us. God knows exactly what our needs are. And our greatest need is to be right with God. It's to have our sin forgiven. It's to have Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit indwell us. It's our greatest need. And Jesus knows that. And He wants to meet our need. He wants to forgive our sins. The third thing I want you to notice is this. Jesus loves me. Jesus knows my name. Jesus knows everything about me. And Jesus loves me. When He stopped that day, I don't know exactly the schedule Jesus was on, but evidently He was moving on. But when He saw Zacchaeus, He stopped and He said, come down and I'd like to invite myself to spend the day with you. Why did He do that? He loved Him. He loved Him with a Calvary love, with an eternal love, with I shed my blood for your sins love. There's another passage of Scripture. I have another sermon about uh, you know, bringing people to Jesus. I think about the rich young ruler. He, he came to Jesus at the right time. He came when he was young. He came to the right person. He came to Jesus Christ. He asked the right question. What must I do to have eternal life? But the Scripture says this, when Jesus saw Him coming, this is Mark 10, 21, Jesus looked at Him and loved Him. Amen. When He saw Him coming, He looked at Him. And by the way, the young man did not give his heart to Jesus. What a tragedy but he could never stand before God at the great white throne judgment and say, no one ever loved my soul because Jesus did love His soul. Amen. Precious people, listen to the Scripture. 
God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. Paul also wrote, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. He loved me. How, and then listen to the Scripture again. How, again, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. I like that word lavished. God has lavished His Word on us and we can be called the children of God. Again, 1 John 4.10 This is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. It's not just a song that little people sing. We ought to always sing it. I sing it when I'm by myself. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Oh, little ones to Him belong. They are weak, but He is strong. Jesus loves me, He who died. Heaven's gates to open wide. If I love Him when I die, He will take me home on high. Don't take it lightly. Jesus Christ, Christ loves you individually and personally. What a blessing. What a blessing. Just Jesus in me. Oh, He knows my name. He knows who I am, what I am. He loves me. There's a fourth thing. Jesus wants to be with me. I imagine, I don't know if he had false teeth or not, but Zacchaeus lost them when Jesus said, I want to go home with you. I want to go to your house. I want to spend the day with you. Because Jesus wants to be with us. With us. It is so much a blessing. I'm so glad that I was born on this side of the birth of Jesus, the life of Jesus the death and the resurrection of Jesus, that I was born on this side of the coming of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit's always been here in the creation and coming upon certain men to, in the Old Testament, the prophets to preach and to teach the Word. But you see, ever since the day of Pentecost, ever since the Holy Spirit has come, he comes when we say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. I turn away from sin. Come and live in my heart. And the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. He is in us. He will never leave us. We may grieve Him. We may quench Him. But we will never run Him away. We are sealed unto the day of redemption. We have the very life of Christ Himself. The very person of Jesus in the person of the Holy Spirit making this body His temple, His home, His residence. And He lives in us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm so grateful for that kind of relationship. You know, sometimes we talk about the Christian religion, and I guess it's okay to say that, but really it's not a religion. It's really a relationship, a personal, individual relationship with the God of the ages, with the Christ of creation, and with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is in us. He wants us. He wants to be with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. By the way, when He puts your name in the book of life, it's not with a pencil, with an eraser on the other end. It's an indelible ink. It'll always be there. Hallelujah. I'm sorry, I'm half Baptist coastal, but brother, I tell you what, it burns in my bones. It, it swells in my heart of who Jesus is and what He wants to do for every individual person. Just Jesus and me. Look at number five. Jesus wants me to know Him. He wants me to know Him. And I'm so grateful for the New Testament. By the way, there are 333 prophecies in the Old Testament about His first coming. 
333. He filled every, fulfilled every one to the dotting of the I and the crossing of the T. T. 333 from Genesis to Malachi about His first coming. There are 318 verses in the New Testament about His second coming. And don't, don't spend your time looking for the undertaker. Look for the upper taker because He is going to come and there's so many signs today that would say something about the possibility that Jesus could split the skies any day, but Jesus really wants me to know Him. As one of His disciples, it means I'm a follower. It means that I'm a learner, that I'm a servant. It means I'm a child of God. And Jesus wants me to know so many things about Him. He wants to teach me so many things about the Christian life. For instance, we said a pretty good prayer this morning. The disciples asked him, teach us to pray, and he gave us what we call the Lord's Prayer. I really think the Lord's Prayer is John 17, chapter 17, and this is the model prayer that we said this morning, but I tell you what, it is a tremendous prayer. I don't know of anyone that, anyone that could improve upon that prayer. Jesus wants us to know that uh, when the time comes that we have troubles and heartaches, that He says, come unto Me all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest and take My yoke upon you. He said, I'm, I'm humble and I'm tender in heart. I'll receive you. I want you to know Me, who I am, what I can do for you, how I want to bless you. May we always keep in mind that we never know everything there is to know about Jesus. If I know anything at all, it's how little I know about, about God's Word. When I read it, I learn something fresh in you all the time. I learn something fresh in you about God. We never exhaust. We can never really go to the depths of knowing everything about who God is. What exactly happened on that cross when He said, My God, my God, why have You forsaken me? I don't know all that that means to be alone. Billy Graham, the great evangelist, said, The hardest part of the cross is the loneliness of the cross. He died alone. He died for me. He died for you. He took the wrath all the wrath for all the sins of every person that ever been born or will ever be born. He took all of that upon Himself. I don't know all that that means, but it's beyond my comprehension. I just receive it by faith and let it work in my heart and know what Jesus did when He died. All that it means when He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again. I'm going to receive you unto Myself. That where I am, there you can be also. Oh my, what's heaven going to be like? Streets of gold and walls of jasper. And praise the Lord, no devil and no disease and no death. You take out those three D's and it is heaven. If you can just remove the devil and disease and death. Jesus really wants us to know Him. Look at number six. Jesus wants me to live the best life. He wants me to live the best life. The Bible says about Zacchaeus, it says that he was wealthy. I guess he had about all that money could buy. If he had... It was a chief tax collector, and then he had other people working for him, and he was always taking illegally from the Jewish people money and pocketing it. And when he met the quota that was due to Rome, then he got to keep all of that. I tell you, the man had a full purse, but he was an empty person. Amen. He was an empty person. You can have all the wealth of this world. I cannot help but think of one of the wealthiest men one of the wealthiest men, his greatest fear is dying. <laughs> he, he's afraid to die. He's got billions and billions of dollars. My favorite verse in all the Bible is for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Absent from the body and present with the Lord. No, Jesus wants us to have the best life. The best life. 
When the Holy Spirit comes to live in us at new birth, we are born of the Spirit, we're baptized with the Spirit, we're sealed with the Spirit, our body is changed into the home for the Spirit in which to dwell. He starts immediately producing His fruit in us. You remember the ninefold fruit that Paul talks about in Galatians 5, 22 through 23? Listen to them carefully. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Money can't buy that. Good works can't purchase that. It's a gift of God through the fruit of the Holy Spirit being produced in us. The Lord Jesus also said, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. Life with meaning, life with purpose, life on a firm foundation. The very best that heaven can give in in an earthly setting, God wants us to have it. Oh man, to live on the happy side of Sunshine Avenue. That's where God wants us to live. I'm glad my residence is right there. Right there. God wants us, He wants us to have the best life. It doesn't mean it's going to be free of all disease or sickness or death or troubles, but it means that even when those things happen, we don't have to drown in our tears. Brother, we can cling to Jesus Cling to Jesus. What's the seventh thing? Jesus wants me to be a blessing to others. He wants me to be a blessing to others. Zacchaeus stood up and he said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'm going to pay him back four times. Paul quotes Jesus and he says this in the book of Acts, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Acts 20 verse 35. Now then, we're going to shift over just a moment. I want to use a little bit. I hope it's sanctified. I want to use some sanctified imagination but I think it very, very easily could be reality. (laughs) Zacchaeus goes down to the bank and he draws out an enormous sum of money. And he goes up to the synagogue. Now he is a Jew, son of Abraham. He's, He's a Jew. And he says to Rabbi, smell fungus. He says, Rabbi, I want to give this money for you to give to the poor. I want you to give it to the poor. I imagine uh, Rabbi Smell Fungus probably crossed his eyes and he said, is this Zacchaeus? Is this really Zacchaeus? The chief tax collector bringing this money in to give to the poor? And those people that he knew he had personally ripped them off in over-collecting taxes, he said, now, I took this from you, but I'm going to give you back four times what I took. Don't you believe that could have really happened just like that? That he could have gone back and started repaying these people. He started being a a blessing. A blessing. And God wants us to be a blessing. Listen to an old hymn. Out in the highways and byways of life, many are weary and sad. Carry the sunshine where darkness is rife, making the sorrowing glad. Tell the sweet story of Christ and His love. Tell of His power to forgive. Others will trust Him if only you prove true every moment you live. Give as t'was given to you in your need. Love as the Master loved you. Be to the helpless a helper indeed. Unto your mission be true. Make me a blessing. Make me a blessing 
out of my life. May Jesus shine. Make me a blessing, O oh Savior, I pray. Make me a blessing to someone today. And my dear people, that is the abundant life when the Holy Spirit produces His fruit and you become a blessing, a blessing to others. Sometimes it's just a kind word. Sometimes it's just a gentle hug. Sometimes it is something out of your pocketbook. Sometimes it's something you can do with your hands. With your hands. But God wants us to be a blessing. To be a blessing. Number eight. You've never heard an eight-point sermon, have you? Well, you just did. You just did. Number eight. Jesus wants me to live with Him forever. Jesus said unto him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. In our lifetime, two things are going to happen. Now one of them may not, but two possibilities in our lifetime. Number one, we're going to die. Now, don't get all morbid and don't get your blood pressure up to 190. But it's a reality, people. You know, one of the things I looked at this morning at the breakfast table, I looked over at the obituary column to see if, uh, well, yeah, I'll make sure my name wasn't there, but to see if anybody I knew was there. Two weeks ago, I looked there. And a lady who lived three doors up the street from me named Rita Pitts, she came out, her and her husband, a lot of mornings would be out on their little kind of a outside place eating their breakfast in the summertime. And I got to know them. I walk, try to walk two miles most days of the week. And I walked that cul-de-sac just a little ways from my house. And uh, they got to know me and I got to visiting with them. One day I was going by there and she came running out to me. She said, my husband died. I said, Rita, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. I, I knew him. Homer, I knew him. She said, he died about two weeks ago. I said, I'm so sorry. I said, could I pray for you? Standing in the middle of the street in the cul-de-sac. I said, could I just pray for you? She said, please do. Please do. Two weeks ago, I was looking down through that column and she had to move into a care facility. She couldn't be by herself. And uh, there was her name. There was her picture. And I remember that day I stood in the street and just had a prayer for her. We're going to die, folks. Be ready. Be ready. Jesus wants us to live with Him forever. He wants our name in that book of life. That's how much He loves us. I go and prepare a place for you that where I am, there you can be also. Paul says we have a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Amen. Second thing is Jesus can come. He's going to come, folks. God's kept every promise. There are 6,000 promises in His Bible for His people. He keeps those promises. And he, Jesus said, if I go away, I'm going to come again. Receive you unto Myself. He's going to come. Be ready. Be ready. So, I know that Jesus wants me to live with Him forever. He came to seek and to save my soul. He came to give His life a ransom for my soul. He wants me to be with Him for eternity. Just Jesus in me. Amen. Just Jesus in me. And that's eight things that I learned from the life of Zacchaeus about Jesus and me. I want to close with a passage of Scripture. When Jesus was with those 11 faithful apostles, Judas had gone to sell him for the price of a slave. He was teaching them in John 14, 15, 16, Still in the upper room, as I'm going to read uh, from chapter 14, because at the end of the chapter it says, Come now, let us leave. They'd be leaving the upper room where they 
they observed the Lord's Supper and the Passover meal. But in verse 15, If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another counselor, that's the Holy Spirit, comforter, to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him, for He lives with you and will be in you. On the day of Pentecost, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. (laughs) Do you know Jesus personally? Is your name in the book of eternal life? If you die, are you going to go to heaven? As kindly as I can say it, don't walk out these doors today if you don't have Jesus in your heart. If it's not Jesus in me, don't leave today. Let that happen. Let it be Jesus in me. Jesus and me. You have a church home, church family. There's something about, a precious lady said to me this morning before the service started, she's talking about COVID and couldn't come to church. And she said, there's just something about being in the church and with God's people. And there is something about that. You need a spiritual family. You need to be a part of God's family. You need to be a child of God. If God would have you put your membership in this church, I'd encourage you to do it today. Today. So we don't know who the pastor is going to be. The Lord Jesus Christ will pastor this church until you get a human being to come and to be your pastor. So I'd just come on. I'd do it. I'd nail it down. Let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, I am so thankful that we can have a personal relationship with You. Almighty God, eternal God, we can have a relationship with You. We can be called the sons of God because of You, Lord Jesus. Because of You. You created everything that's created. You created us in God's image. You died for us. Holy Spirit, I want to thank You for going out on Easter Sunday morning and raising Jesus from the dead. Romans chapter 8 says that's exactly what you did, Holy Spirit. You raised Him from the dead. And you've given us a living Savior, oh God. I thank you that we just, we don't have a religion. We have a relationship. A relationship. We call you Father. We call Jesus our Savior. We call the Holy Spirit our indweller. How blessed we are. God, I pray if there's anybody here today that does not know Christ, their name's not in the book of life, that they would come today and let Jesus, let it be Jesus and me, Jesus and me. There are people that need a church family, a church home. I pray they'd come, oh God. Holy Spirit, move powerfully here for the glory of God, for the sake of souls. Move powerfully. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.